Well, we are undertaking a review, a study, an exploration of the book of Genesis. And I wish I could find the words to tell you how excited I am about this because uh, we've done it before, but we've, uh, we, we had recordings that were really quite dated and the staff wouldn't let me do Genesis again until we had some other commitments put behind us. So they finally have okayed an opportunity to jump in and review the book of Genesis. Many of you uh, probably have been with us through our Learn the Bible in 24 Hours, which is a survey, of course. Um, and many of you have been with us through our Revelation series. And it may su be surprising that the natural, one of the natural places to start studying the Bible is the book of Revelation, strangely. But one of the natural places to go to after the book of Revelation is indeed uh, the book of Genesis, for, and just to, to, to close the loop, if you will. And you'll see why as we go. But uh, we are um, uh, in, in an ex exploration of very fundamental significance to all of us, more so than many other studies might uh, 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 be able to claim. You see, there are only two worldviews that impact all of us. The first is that everything is the result of a cosmic accident. That is the prevailing view taught in our schools. Those of you that have children in our government schools know what you're up against there. And it's this view that we're just some kind of cosmic accident that leads to Columbine High School, that leads to the lawlessness that pervades not just our streets, but also our courts and elsewhere. The other worldview is that we are the result of a deliberate design by a designer. Every worldview that you might hold derives from one of these two presuppositions. And so we're not just joining a study of the book of Genesis, we're plunging right into a very fundamental root belief that affects all of us. And uh, so, there are four questions that will derive from any of these worldviews. First of all, who am I? Who am I really? Where did I come from? We all ask ourselves that question, especially when we're young, but all through our lives, that question lurks behind every other attitude we might have. Because it, it, it also begs the question, why are we here? And where are we going when we die? Death is in front of all of us. We're in a brief tragically brief uh, sojourn with an ultimate destiny. Where will we spend it? What will it be like? All these things derive from those two world, uh, one of those two worldviews, and these questions are fundamental to almost everything we think or believe. So one of the things that we've all been victim of is the skepticism that has emerged in recent decades. Um, there's been uh, all kinds of so pseudo-scholars that attack the historicity of the Bible in general, and especially the book of Genesis, and especially the first 11 chapters. And uh, there, there's been a view that they didn't even have writing in the days of Moses. This was a very prevalent view for uh, uh, centuries ago. And also that the Gospels and the Epistles of the New Testament were written in the second century, a couple hundred years after the fact. All of this, fortunately, has been debunked in our time. You and I have the benefit of much more effective scholarship through archaeological discoveries, through document, documentary uh, discoveries, and competent analysis. So the good news is much of what you may have heard in, in uh, some of the skeptical texts or TV programs of the past are shredded by the facts. They're ganged up mercilessly by reality. And uh, so we're going to t have the advantage of that. I want to underscore two discoveries that underpin our particular ministry and attitude towards these things. The first is that we have in our laps this evening 66 books, and these 66 books were penned by over 40 different authors and uh, over a period of almost 2,000 years. And the discovery is, first of all, that this group of 66 books are an integrated message We've discovered that every detail in these books is there by design. And that's something you really need to discover for yourself to have impact. But as you do your study, I want you to be sensitive to the fact that as you go, you'll begin to discover for yourself the integrity of the whole. And as you do that, that leads to a second discovery. The first discovery, as I say, is that we have an, in our possession an integrated message system. Even though there's 66 books by over 40 guys who didn't even know each other and done over thousands of years, we know 
now know that the origin of that message system has to have occurred from outside the dimensionality of time. Not just because it writes history in advance, the very structure of the text anticipates information that emerges thousands of years later. So it's a clearly skillful design from outside our time domain. And from these two discoveries, I can make the assertion, you say, well, you can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can if you do your homework because you can prove its integrity of design, and having done that, you can demonstrate its origin from being outside the time dimension. And so we're gonna, that's gonna, this whole idea is that we have the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And as that, as that gets demonstrated in your own study, it will alter your whole attitude about this collection of manuscripts we call the Bible. It has a central theme. The Old Testament is basically the account of a nation. The New Testament is an account of a man. We're going to be talking about the creation in this study, but one of the things that's exciting about the creation is that the, crea the creator himself became a man. And his appearance is the central event of all history. He died to purchase us, and he is alive today. And our most exalted privilege is to know him. And that's really what the Bible is all about. I'm really excited about the book of Genesis for lots of reasons. Many of you that know me know that, well, I'm a, a, a kind of a science buff. I have a lot of physics in my background and so forth. So that's one of the reasons, because Genesis is full of that, of course. Another reason is that most of you know that I'm a prophecy buff. I'm very much interested in you know, eschatology and so forth. But that's not the reason that Genesis is so exciting. There's even a third reason that you've got to discover for yourself, and that is that Jesus Christ is on every page. Jesus Christ is on every page of the book of Genesis. And when you start to see that, when you start to feel that, when you realize what's happening, boy, it takes over. It's exciting. So that's what we're really, that's really what we're all about here. We're talking about the Torah. The Greek term is the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. The Hebrew term is the Torah. Genesis, of course, which is the book of beginnings followed by Exodus, the birth of the nation, Leviticus, the law of the nation, Numbers, the wilderness wandering, because they didn't have the faith to take advantage of the situation when it was available to them, and then Deuteronomy, which is essentially a, a, a few sermons by Moses recapping all of that, the laws reviewed, and so forth. These are the five books called the Torah in Hebrew. And uh, now, before we start, I decided to, I was going to put this at the end as just a little tag along, except it occurred to me, I put it up, up early because if nothing else, it may give you a slightly different perspective of the text itself. We're going to talk a lot as we get into the study about the, the exposition of the text, what it's talking about and, and substantively, but there's also another level of understanding that comes from the text itself, and I thought it would be interesting to show this. You know, people ask me frequently, are there hidden codes in the Bible? And uh, there absolutely are. There's so much nonsense and so much contrived uh, foolishness around that many people get uh, disenchanted with the idea of hidden messages in the scripture, but they are there, and I want to show you a few. Proverbs 25 2 tells you that. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it's the honor or duty of kings to search out the matter. Way back in the 16th century, Rabbi Cordovero pointed out that the secrets of the Torah are revealed in the skipping of letters. So this idea of Bible codes is not a new idea. It's a rediscovery of things that were known centuries ago. There are dozens of different kinds of encryptions in the scripture. And I'm not going to go through all those here. Relax. But there's one particular kind that is called an equidistant letter sequence. And it's the one that's being very much abused by, by promoters and things. But nevertheless, there are some that are real. The equidistant letter sequence. Here's an this is a contrived example to give you an idea what they are. On the screen, there's a sentence. Rips explained that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word. That's just a, an arbitrary sentence I put on the screen. But it turns out that if you take every fourth letter of that, that's an equidistant letter sequence of the spacing of uh, three between each letter, you then discover that every fourth letter forms another message. In this case, it's, it says, read the code. This is just a demonstration to give you a feeling for what we mean by an equidistant letter sequence. This technique was known to the ancient rabbis. 
this is one of many, when those uh, rabbinical experts rose to power in the courts of Europe during the Renaissance period, they were the experts that contrived the cryptography available to the various kings. So if you study the history of secret writing or cryptography, you'll discover it really has its roots in the, among the ancient rabbis in ancient Israel, and it's traceable through the courts of Europe as they invent better and more sophisticated codes, leaning on their, their, their insights. And it, because the codes got so sophisticated in World War II, the, uh, uh, we developed computers to break the codes. That's what Turing uh, in, in uh, uh, John von uh, Neumann in the United States and Alan Turing in Britain were the two experts that really gave us the modern computer. But his original mission was to, br to break the Nazi codes, which it did. But it's interesting that those same computers have now allowed us to rediscover the very things that the rabbis knew thousands of years ago. And so it's a very fascinating study. But let me just give you one example to give you a flavor of this. This is uh, Genesis chapter 1 in Hebrew. Now, I want to remind you that Hebrew goes from right to left. Also, the word Torah in Hebrew is spelled with four letters. A ta, which is roughly equivalent to our T, an O, a resh, a he, um, four letters. If you go to the first how in the book of Genesis, and uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet that happens. And you count 49 letters, you come to a vav. You count 49 more letters, and you come to a resh, which is sort of like our r. And you count 49 more letters, you come to a he. So that is four, those four letters spelled Torah. Now I need to remind you that all languages flow towards Jerusalem. Did you know that? All nations east of Jerusalem go from right to left. All nations west of Jerusalem go from left to right. All languages flow towards Jerusalem. I don't know what you're going to do with that piece of information, <laughs> but I think it's interesting. Now, you can follow this without knowing Hebrew, probably, but you say, now, why 49? Was a square of seven? Okay, that's fine. That's not, that, not too surprising, but just a coincidence, of course, or is it? Now, you could argue, well, that's just an accident of the frequency of letters and so forth. It's kind of rare, but interesting. Except what happens is when you go to the book of Exodus, you go to the first tau, count 49 letters, you get a vav, 49 letters, you get a resh, 49 letters, and you get a hey. Same thing happens. What's the probability of that? Whatever the first probability is, it's that squared. <laughs> okay? So it's very unlikely. Genesis, Exodus, you go to Leviticus and it doesn't happen. And when it doesn't, you almost feel a sigh of relief. Huh? But when you go to Numbers, the same thing happens backwards. You take the first hey, the first resh, the first vav, the first tau. You get Torah spelled backwards. Now that's weird. What's, if nothing else, I don't know how they found this out. They must have had time on their hands. You know. <laughs> they didn't have computers. You know, this was... You go to Deuteronomy, you have essentially the same equivalent thing happens. And now you're puzzled because you've got it forward, forward, backward, backward. You can't resist going back to Leviticus and looking at Leviticus more closely. We have 49 and the 7 squared letter sequences. Torah, Torah, forward in Genesis, Exodus, uh, backwards in Numbers and Deuteronomy. Well, if you look at Leviticus, you discover that every seventh letter spells the unpronounceable name of God often rendered Jehovah or Yahweh, trans, uh, re, re, uh, uh, expressed as Adonai among the Hebrews. They won't pronounce that name. They'll use Lord, the word Lord instead. Well, now we stand back from all of this. We have the, the name of God, and we suddenly realize that the Torah always points to the name of Jehovah. Now, what's the chance of that happening by accident? And by the way, if you've tried to contrive something like this and still maintain logic in the text, that's a challenge. This is a very non-trivial thing to design if you set out to design it that way. So uh, many of us tend to regard these kinds of things in general as fingerprints of the Holy Spirit. And uh, you'll see some others as we go through the book, but uh, I thought the real question, of course, is who wrote the Torah? Who wrote the five books of Moses? Many of you may be victims of 
the so-called liberal scholars, you know, this term liberal really is starting to bother me. We use it politically to describe those that are of, 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 of modern or liberal persuasion, as they would like to be called. Also, there's scholars that um, call themselves liberal because they weren't shackled to the conservatism, conservatism of the past. The more I read, both whether it's in the political, contemporary political arena or whether it's in the classical scholastic arena, I get troubled by that term because it's not descriptive. To be liberal is to be broad-minded. These people aren't broad-minded. They're not tolerant unless you agree with them. Um, the only term I can think of is subversive. But let's get back to this. There is a thing that's called formally the graf wellhausen hypothesis because he formalized some thoughts that were emerging in what was called the German school of higher criticism, 16th century and following. And uh, out of this came what's called the documentary hypothesis. And many of you, if you go uh, to, uh, to a bookstore and look at some of the commentaries, if you find this kind of thing in there, it's a real uh, flag in terms of where they're coming from. The idea is that the, Moses didn't really write the five books of Moses. It was compiled later by other editors. And uh, they contrive textual reasons to justify this view. Uh, they, they, they notice that the name of God is Yah Yahweh or Jehovah. The reason Jehovah came around, this came out of Germany, so the, the J is like a Y, so it's the Yahweh is really the way, Jehovah or whatever. Anyway, the J documents are those that are attributed to an a editor that leaned on using that name of God. Whereas others, the Elohist was the, the name for the creator. Certain passages in the five books of Moses use the one name frequently. The other one uses a different name. So they argued on that basis that there, are, there were different editors. Then there's other sources are from what they call a Deuteronomic source. And then there's a priestly source. And, uh, and this gets carried away as people needed PhD theses to write. They started breaking these down so they have all kinds. They, they, they treat the idea that this was all compiled maybe as late as the days of Ezra, which of course is utter nonsense. They did this, by the way, without any compelling evidence. This is just a contrived view to get away from the, the reality of the past. These views have been shredded by a number of scholars uh, through the last uh, 100 years or so. And, uh, but I'm going to save you, the one thing you get out of this meeting, I'm going to save you hours of really boring library research to go through these arguments, pro and con. It's an, absolute, it's an absolute waste of time, scholastically, because there are scholars that have shredded that. Just at this point, take my word for that part of it. There's a shortcut. And the shortcut occurs in Luke uh, 24. All of us know the first half of that chapter because it's what we would call Easter morning at the tomb. But we're going to focus on briefly here an event that occurred that afternoon. It's recorded in Luke 24. You can follow me with your Bibles if you like uh, from verse 13, but I'll have it on the screen for the, for, so we can go to, over it together. Two disciples went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. Now, I realize there's not a lot of horse players among us here. You may not know that a furlong is an eighth of a mile. So that turns out to be uh, 60 stadia or 60 furlongs is essentially um, seven and a half miles from Jerusalem. Anyway, these two disciples are going on a, a, what's going to turn out to be a seven and a half mile Bible study. Because as they walked, they talked together of all these things which had happened. Get the picture now. This is Sunday afternoon. A few days ago, they were present when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. He was buried. And uh, anyway, so they're, they're shook. They're disillusioned, confused, whatever. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. So they're, the two disciples are walking along this road. Jesus joins them, but they don't recognize who he is. We don't know why he, did, he wasn't recognized. Whatever reason there was gets removed by verse 31. So let's not worry about it. I have personally some conjectures as to why they didn't recognize him. Um, we know from Isaiah 50, there are some details of his crucifixion that are not recorded in the New Testament. One of which is the Romans ripped off his beard. And so if nothing else, what we have here is a scar-tissued face with no beard where they were used to seeing him. So that's at least 
a conjectural uh, uh, possibility. In any case, from their point of view, he's just a stranger. People often ask me, does God have a sense of humor? And I'll point them to this passage to, to make a point. Because the, here he joins them, and they don't realize who he is. And uh, now, by the way, if you and I were, were, were stage managing this or writing a, a shooting script, we'd probably resort to some kind of cataclysmic announcement. Hey, guys, don't you know who I am? You know, a flash of thunder, something, you know. He, notice what he does. He said to them, the stranger says to them, what manner of communications are these that you have one to, one to another as you walk and are sad? Now, he joins these strange, uh, strangers, apparently, and he says, why are you so glum? What's bothering you guys? And one of them, whose name is Cleopas, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast thou not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? So he walks up and says, hey, guys, why so glum? And they turn to him and say, where were you, fella? You know, that's the flavor of it. But this is the line that just kills me. I love verse 19. Jesus says to them, what things? I don't know how you could pull that off with a straight face. Here he was put through six trials through the night, all of which were illegal. He was uh, uh, badly abused, crucified, dead, buried in the grave three days. And he can come to these guys and say, what things? I mean, that, that, that's got to be... Uh, that takes the cake for me. I, anyway, so, he, so, and they said unto him, and then they explained to him what happened from their point of view, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. And we trusted that it had been he that should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. So they're explaining to him, Oh, and then they continue. Yea, and certain women, also of our company, made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. When they found not his body, they came saying that they'd also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even as the women had said. But him they saw not. So this is their summary of the, of the episode. Then Jesus now speaks. But by the way, he still doesn't identify who he is. What's interesting, he speaks of himself in the third person. He said to them, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ, that guy, <laughs> ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And here's the key verse for us right now. And beginning at what? Moses, Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. These guys were treated to a seven and a half mile Bible study by the author, not just of the study of the entire world. I love that line. It says, he was crucified on a cross of wood, but he made the hill on which it stood. That's the one that, we're, that we have to do with tonight. And they drew near to the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, abide with us. For it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and broke it and gave to them. That's bizarre. In a Jewish home, the host reserves the role of breaking the bread and so forth. He's the guest, but he takes charge. And when he breaks the bread and gave it to them, then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, <laughs> and then he vanished out of their sight. They will join him that evening because they're going to head back to Jerusalem and share all this and behind closed doors he will show up. You know the story. But it's, um, but it's interesting to, um, to, when they get back there at the upper room, they're going to explain that they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. What was that in the breaking of bread that would reveal to them something they hadn't noticed for a seven and a half mile walk? Anyone? Nail prints in his wrists. Absolutely. Now, they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Boy, that's the kind of heartburn we all want, right? This, uh, the, uh, 
the, the, the rebuttal of the documentary hypothesis comes from none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got no problem as to who wrote the Torah, the books of Moses. Jesus told you, and he ought to know. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you've got bigger problems than who authored the Torah, so we'll get into that later. The Emmaus Road example is the one I prefer to use, but the authentication of Moses shows up all through the New Testament. That Moses, the books of Moses are quoted, all of them are quoted in the New Testament. Jesus himself quotes from all five, attributing them to Moses specifically. Um, all scriptures, by the way, are Christ-centered. John 5, they're going to search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, he says, and so forth. In Psalm 40, verse 7, the Lord says, the volume of the book is written of me. Yes, he says it in Psalm 40, but it's also authenticated in uh, Hebrews 10, and uh, so on. In the Old Testament, Adam is quoted, uh, uh, referred to in Deuteronomy, in Job, 1 Chronicles, Noah in 1 Chronicles, Isaiah, Ezekiel. Abraham, 15 times in the Old Testament, 11 times in the New. See, one thing about the Bible, it's all interlocked. Once you discover that, each piece strengthens all the others. You start pulling one piece out or another, the whole thing will start to unravel. Jacob, 20 times in the Old Testament, 17 times in the New. The New Testament quotes of Genesis include 165 direct quotes and probably about 200 allusions. And over a hundred of those are, in, of, are quotes from the first 11 chapters. We're going, to, we're going to discover the book of Genesis is generally partitioned into two parts. The first 11 chapters, which some people would call prehistory. And then from the call of Abraham on, 12 to the end. So those are the two. The, 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 the attack is different. But just to pick one of these, Jesus also comments in John 5, verse 45 through 47, he says, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? We as Christians need to realize that. We focus on the New Testament. We need to understand that unless you can... Um, Express yourself regarding the Old Testament, especially the book of Genesis. Uh, you're missing a major part of your uh, witness as uh, to, to the, the Lord of the, the Bible. Now, we'll find, uh, I, I said there's 165 of them. I thought we'd go through each one carefully tonight. But the, the video people thought it might be a rather lengthy production. So I'll just give you a quick. The Creator and Creation, is, there's a list of these. They'll be uh, in the publications for you. Um, the, the allusions to the creation all through uh, all the gospels, all the epistles, one place or another, the creation of man and woman, the fall of man. All, these are all central themes. The flood of Noah, the, uh, the patriarchs, of course. All these are foundational, so it doesn't surprise us that it's interweaved throughout the entire New Testament. And Jesus indeed said, said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. They are they which testify me. Jesus Christ is on every page. In fact, Gospel of John, you know, the other, uh, 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 both Matthew and, and, uh, and uh, Luke have genealogies. Mark's the only one without a genealogy. But uh, Matthew, and Matthew has the Jewish genealogy and Luke, the, in a sense, the Gentile one, uh, the bloodline, if you will. But um, there is a genealogy in John that's not recognized as such by most, and that's the first few verses. In the beginning was the word. Now, that's a title of Jesus Christ. It's very clear as you get into it. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. By whom? Jesus Christ, exactly. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And uh, John uses that as a title of Jesus Christ, the Logos. And uh, Paul in Colossians 1 says, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. The thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers are, in the Greek, ranks of angels. Who created the angels? Anyone? Jesus Christ. What about the super angels called cherubim? Who created them? 
Jesus Christ. What about the cherubim that was appointed on top of, to run, you know, to cover all the rest? Jesus. Got a secret for you. Write this down in your notes. Satan is not Christ's brother. Okay. Just thought you could jot that down someplace. There are people that hold that view. Pray for them. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. That Greek word it really means composed, established, or held together. By him are all things held together. And I'm fascinated by that as you read, as you get into particle physics, and you, the scientists are puzzled what, what holds the nucleus together. You know, we know that, that uh, like charges repel, unlike charges attract. So we have an atom with positive nucleus and got electrons running around it and so forth. That makes sense. But wait a minute. You've got all these protons. I thought protons repelled each other. What holds it? Well, that's held together by nuclear glue. Really? That's interesting. And I won't get into part. We're going to get into particle physics in a couple later sessions. I won't get into here. But, but uh, no, I, I, I suspect that at the root of this, at the root of it, is Jesus Christ. And there's a day coming when he's going to let go. The day he's going to let go. So that's going to be exciting. Why study the book of Genesis? Well, there's lots of reasons. It's the book of beginnings. Um, Creation, man, woman, Sabbath, marriage, home, childhood, sin, murder, sacrifice, grace, trade, agriculture, city life, races, languages. You can make an endless list of things which begin in Genesis. And uh, there's something else that you'll learn as you study your Bible more and more. You'll discover what, uh, what scholars sometimes call the law of first mention. The first place that something is mentioned they've discovered, tends to be very significant. It tends to color it from that point on. And we're going to discover that in a very surprising way when you get to chapter 22 of Genesis, in a way that I don't want to steal the thunder, we'll wait till we get there. But the, each one of these things has a beginning here and has a climax where? Make a guess. Revelation, exactly. You'll get the sense that Genesis and Revelation were designed to go as a pair, like bookends. Genesis anticipates all false philosophies. Atheism, no, we're created by God. Pantheism, that God is everywhere. No, God is transcendent and distinguishable from the creation. It's interesting that all the mythologies tend to regard the super god, be it Zeus or whatever, as derivative, as, as within the creation. They don't have a transcendent God, not really. And, uh, but the, our, the God of the Bible is transcendent and distinguishable from his creation. He did enter it, but don't let that confuse you. Polytheism says, you know, says there's many gods. No, clearly we, we, we speak of one God and we'll hit that very hard. Materialism, in the sense that, not talking about materialistic living here, talking about materialism that, 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 that uh, everything is just matter. No, matter itself had a beginning. Matter wasn't always here is the point. And uh, humanism, no, it's God, not man. That's the ultimate reality. And uh, Evolutionism. We're going to talk a lot about that. No, God created. We're going to hit that very hard in the first two chapters of the book. Uniformism. No, God intervenes in his history. You know, scientists like take the, take the view that things always happen a certain way. Call them laws. Well, no. It turns out there's lots of evidence that God intervenes in those laws, and uh, not only in history, but also in our lives. And all the major doctrines of the Bible have their roots in the book of Genesis. Sovereign election. Salvation, um, justification by faith, believer security, separation, disciplinary chastisement, divine incarnation, rapture of the church, death and resurrection. The priesthood, it's not just the Aaronic priesthood, but also the Melchizedek priesthood, has its roots in Genesis. The Antichrist, the Palestinian covenant, the very basis of the world tension today, God's land grant to Israel, which is at issue before the UN and before the world. Zechariah tells us the entire world's going to go to war over the city of Jerusalem. You've got to be kidding. Here's a city that's got no natural resources, no river, no harbor. There's no reason for it to be strategically relevant in the modern world. Its only relevance is religious, and we live in an a-religious world. And yet, exactly what Zechariah portrays is going on as we speak. So, kind of interesting. As we look at Genesis and Revelation, we find an interesting contrast. You know, in Genesis, we have the earth created. In Revelation, the earth passes away. In Genesis, we have the sun to govern the day. In Revelation, there's no need for the sun. Darkness he called night in Genesis. There's no night there in Revelation. The waters he called the seas. There is no more sea in Revelation chapter two, two, 21. In Genesis, we find a river for earth's blessing. 
And in Revelation, we have a river for the new earth. <clears throat> the earth's government is mentioned in Genesis uh, 37. And we have the earth's judgment relative to Israel in Revelation 16. Man is made in God's image in Revelation, excuse me, in Genesis, and man's headed by Satan's image in Revelation. We have the entrance of sin in Genesis. We have the end of sin in Revelation 21. The curse is pronounced in Genesis, and there is no more curse in Revelation 22. Death enters in Genesis 3, and there is no more death in Revelation 21. We have a man driven out of Eden in Genesis 3. And we have man restored in Revelation 22. And that's, that's the climax that God alludes to in chapter 3 as he declares war on Satan. Tree of life is guarded in uh, Genesis 3. What is he guarded by, by the way? A cherubim. Why? What's he there for? To keep Adam out, it wouldn't take a cherubim. A normal angel would have been plenty. What was that angel guarding? The way of the tree of life. Who is he guarding it from? Another cherub, huh? We'll talk about that next time. The right to the tree of life. The, 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 the tree of life is guarded in Genesis. The right to access it is returned in, in Revelation 22. Sorrow, sorrow and suffering enter the world in Genesis 3, verse 17. There is no more sorrow in Revelation 22. Nimrod founds Babylon in Genesis 10. Babylon falls in Revelation 17 and 18. And I'm one of these that's beginning to believe that the Antichrist will come out of Assyria. He is called by Micah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel the Assyrian. I think it's going to be Nimrod, not literally, but in effect Nimrod return. God's flood destroyed all e the entire evil generation, chapter 6 through 9 in, in uh, Genesis. Satan's flood to destroy the elect generation is attempted in Revelation 12. We have a, a, a bow, uh, God's promise in G Genesis 9. We have a bow for remembrance in Revelation 4. Sodom and Egypt typify the corruption and judgment in, in Genesis 13 and also in 19. And Sodom and Egypt is an allusion to Jerusalem, strangely, in Revelation 11. And we'll sort that out when we get there. A confederation was put together against Abraham's people. In Genesis, there's a confederation versus Abraham's seed in Revelation 12. There's a bride for Abraham's son in Genesis 24, and there's a bride for Abraham's seed in Revelation 21. The marriage of the first Adam is in Genesis 2 and the marriage of the last Adam in Revelation 19. Man's dominion ceased and Satan's begun in Genesis 3, verse 24. Satan's domain ended and man's restored in Revelation 22. One integrated design from Genesis to Revelation. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. One book. Now if we look at the total panorama of history. This chart may be familiar to you if you've been through or learned the Bible in 24 hours, but we obviously are going to be focusing. Uh, it, well, Genesis, by the way, covers a major portion. It's all the way from the creation to the Exodus. The rest of the Old Testament goes from the Exodus uh, un until the, uh, uh, the exile, of course. The New Testament is in just one lifetime, and there's 400 years between the Testaments. That's profiled for you in advance. Those, aren't, those are not missing years. Scholars call it the silent years. No, they just haven't read Daniel 11. From five, verses 5 and 35, it details those 400 years for you. But in any case, we're focusing on the front end, obviously, of the entire panorama of history. Book of Genesis. Now, the book of Genesis consists of 50 chapters. The first 11 are often treated as a distinct uh, portion, often called prehistory, if you will. And from the call of Abraham in Genesis 12 to the end, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, the four patriarchs, in, 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 a, in a more conventional narrative form, if you will. But um, we will be, uh, we're obviously, we have two chapters um, here on the creation. You know, it's interesting. I want to point out to you that the creation, as exciting as it is, is going to be as we get into it, is the second most important issue. The creation is not as important as another topic. Uh, the creation has what? Two chapters in Genesis, a couple of Psalms, a couple of chapters in Isaiah. 
And that's about it. The redemption is what really the book of Genesis is mostly about. The book of redemption is what Exodus is all about. In fact, you start going through the Bible, you discover the redemption. There's not a book in the Bible that isn't a key part of God's plan of redemption. So if I look at how much space is accorded a subject, I can argue the creation is important, but not nearly, nearly as important as the plan of redemption. The other way to measure value is what did it cost him? Well, the creation cost God, what, six days? He could do it again and will. Um, what did the redemption cost him? His son. So we're going to be talking about the creation, but recognize the, the primary theme is really the redemption, the, the extremes that God went to to redeem you and I from the predicament that we fell into. We're, of course, going to focus in chapter 1 on what's sometimes called the creation week. Day 1 was Sunday. How do I know that? Well, because the sixth day, well, you know, the seventh day was, it was Shabbat, right? So the first day was or is the first day of Shabbat? I mean, right? oh, no, that's right. The first day is Sunday, right? Um, second day is, uh, uh, is uh, Monday. Third day is, is um, Tuesday. And one of your questions for your homework assignment before we get there will be, why, is, why was not Monday blessed? Each one of these days, God saw that what he did and it was good, right? But he didn't say that about what happened on Monday. So I'll let you chew on that in preparation for that time when it comes. But we're going to talk about, um, after we, uh, uh, in day one, is that one of the main things is let light be, the, the creation of light. What does that really mean? What's going on there? Second day, the stretching of space, land and vegetation, sun, moon, stars, fourth day, sea animals and birds on this fifth day, sixth day, animals and so forth. Now, a few assists before we jump into all of this to get a little more background here. The word of God is inexhaustible. That shouldn't surprise us, but we should also recognize one of its features. I don't care how many times you go through a book. Each time you go through, you'll discover something new. I'm fond of teaching a little book of Ruth, a little four-chapter book. And I've done it must, probably 100 times. And yet every time I go through, there's some other nuance that emerges. So don't be surprised as you discover things um, that eluded you before. And remember, the truth is always in the details. Every detail is connected to every other. Why? Because it's an integrated message. And that gives you a, a, a procedure to deal with difficult passages. When you find something you don't understand, if you find something that seems to be a contradiction, praise God right on the spot because hidden behind that apparent problem will be a discovery. If You pray it through. And one of the little tricks you can do is put Christ right in the middle of it and see what happens. So tuck that away in your notes, and now we're going to deal with some fundamental questions. Is the universe about 15 billion years, give or take? That's what the scientists would tell us, right? How many believe the universe is 15 billion years old? My hand is up, by the way. Okay, now it's a politically correct. You can, okay. Or, you know, you see the Hubble telescope and all that? We see hundreds of millions of light years away, don't we? We see galaxies that are hundreds of billions of light years away. Does that mean that light started traveling 100 billion years ago? Didn't, so that, that argues for an old universe, doesn't it? Oh, but the Bible says it was created in six days. Does it mean 144 hours? Are those 24-hour days? How many believe the Bible was created in six days? That's the politically correct response, but do you really? Okay. Okay. Or... And if, if so, then, were the aging factors built in? I don't have a problem with the tree, with the tree being created. It has tree rings. That's not my problem. But, but was, it, was a galaxy created to look like it's 100 billion years away and the light started in transit just a short while ago, cleverly schemed so it looks like it's big? I don't think so. I'll tell you why. Because eight times in the Tanakh, in the Bible, it says the eternal one cannot lie. I don't think God is in the deceiving business. He may hide some things to make us dig for it a little bit, but uh, I don't think God's in the deception business, quite the contrary. So we got this interesting problem here. It's not a trivial one. You know, was light created in transit? I don't think so. 
The other view is where the days of Genesis simply geological eras. Many, many uh, uh, apparently Christian documents try to justify what some people call theistic evolution, that evolution was the mechanism God used to create. Well, that sounds good if you're trying to duck the accountability for the book of Genesis, but that's contrary to what the Bible teaches for lots of reasons. So we've got a problem. We've got a problem. And uh, so uh, evolution is evolution. Evolution is uh, denied by the scripture in many, many ways. So you can't, it turns out, strangely enough, uh, you can't, straddle that issue. I ha there is in every bookstore, I think, these days, a book called In Six Days, in which 50 uh, prominent scientists uh, explain why they believe that the universe is a young universe, that the universe was created in six days, as the Bible says. And uh, so there, there's, for, for those of you, and they're from all different, all PhDs, all from different fields of science, all with, different, all with different reasons for holding that view. So we're not going to go through the book. There's 50, you know, we're not, not going to do that, but be, be aware that that's there as a thing. But we're going to go a little different way. Let's start a little bit with what I'm going to call the nature of reality. You and I uh, need to understand a little bit about hyperspaces. Hyperspace is a fancy word for spaces of more than three dimensions. You and I live in three dimensions. And we're not going to get into a lot of advanced math or anything, relax, but there are some insights you and I can glean from what is now understood about the reality we live in that will cut through most of the theological paradoxes you'll encounter. And uh, so let's get into this. Uh, in school, you either in plane geometry or trigonometry, you had triangles. And you had angles in a triangle. If you add up the angles in a triangle, what does it add up to? Anyone? 180 degrees. Good. No matter what kind of a triangle I have, 30, 60, 90, or 45, 45, 90, whatever, it always adds up to 180 degrees. Well, suppose that two of us go out to a very large field with a transit, and we lay out a very large triangle. We bring the angles back in, and they add up to more than 180 degrees. Well, that's what you expect from a dumb, bunch of dumb pastors or something. No. <laughs> no, it turns out that we've encountered something. Can did anyone here know what we've encountered? If we find a triangle with more than 180 degrees, what's happened? Yes? Curvature of, the Earth. Curvature of the Earth. Good for you. See, if you go into a navigation as a pilot or as a, as a seaman or whatever, you'll take a course in spherical trigonometry in which you can have 90 degrees in each corner. And see, when you encounter something that seems to violate the rule, see, the rule we all learned in school, that the angles of a triangle add up to 100 degrees, is only true for a universe of two dimensions. That's why they call it plane geometry or plane trigonometry. It's only true for a flat plane, you see. If you have more than that, you're dealing with a convex surface. And uh, if you have less than 180 degrees, you're dealing with a hyperbolic paraboloid. But I don't think that is something you're normally going to want to go into. But when you encounter something that violates a rule you've learned, one of the possibilities is that you've encountered a dimension that you didn't know existed. You see, and so uh, that's, it's that kind of insight that caused Dr. Albert Einstein, as he was grappling with the nature of space, to realize that space is not limited to three dimensions. And he developed his theory of relativity by recognizing that it really consists of four, at least. The special relativity was 1905, which was length, mass, velocity, and time are relative to velocity of observers. The general relativity in 1915, was that there was no distinction between time and space. We won't get into the math here, but the point is a physicist will speak of space-time. You can't speak of space and time separately. Time is a dimension of our space. We, you and I live not in three dimensions, in four dimensions, three spatial dimensions and time. And that's no longer just a conjecture. The, this four-dimensional continuum that we now know we live in has been conformed, uh, confirmed 14 different ways to over 19 decimals. And uh, it happens to include an insight that gets around many of the problems we encounter. So we want to talk a little bit about this peculiar dimension that you and I are in called time, the nature of time. Time, it turns out, um, well, let's, let's talk about this first of all. There are atomic clocks located at the National Institute of Science and Techno Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado, and also an identical clock 
at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England. These are atomic clocks. Uh, they're, uh, they're accurate. Both of these are accurate to better than one second per million years. So they're, they're as accurate as we know how to make clocks. They're based on the natural resonance of cesium. I won't get into all that. That's not important. They're just very, they're very, very accurate clocks. But here's the dilemma. The one at Boulder ticks five microseconds a year faster than the identical clock at Greenwich. Every year they have to, they have to make an adjustment. Why? Which one's correct? Greenwich or Boulder? The Brits or our federal government? <laughs> I didn't mean anything by that. That's right. <laughs> well, the, the answer is they both are correct. You see, both are. The Boulder, Colorado is at 5,400 feet altitude, and Greenwich, England is at 80 feet of altitude. And the gravity is different at both places, which means the time, it's not the clock problem, the time itself is different at each place. The atomic clocks, if I had an atomic clock here on the platform, and I raised it one meter, it would speed up by one part in 10 to the 16th. Not a big deal, but it's measurable, predictable, and, and, and uh, confirmable. In fact, uh, they uh, actually did this with an aircraft experiment back in 1971. They put an atomic clock on a plane going around the world eastward. And compared to one at the observatory, uh, it lost 0.059 microseconds, or 59 nanoseconds. They did the same thing with one going westward around the world, and it gained 273 nanoseconds. Not a big deal, but it was exactly what the math mathematicians had predicted because of all the factors involved, the motions and the gravity and so forth. I'll give you another example. This one's, I think, kind of fun. You, if you read a textbook in physics on this subject, you'll discover that they'll usually talk about these two imaginary, hypothetical astronauts. They're both born at the same instant. And we're going to send one of them to the nearest star. The nearest star to us happens to be Alpha Centauri. It's about roughly four and a half light years away. If you look at the night sky, there actually is a star called Alpha Centauri. And that's the, that's the nearest one to us. And uh, it is about four and a half light years away. We're going to send one of these guys, we'll leave one here with us, we're going to send one of them to that star and back. Now, we're going to send them, we're going to send them there at half the speed of light. This is obviously theoretical. And uh, so that means that here on the Earth, it's going to take him, since it's four and a half light years, it's going to half the speed of light, it'll take him nine years to get there, nine years to come back. So he'll return in 18 years. Are we together so far? Okay. But what time is it on his clock? He's got a wristwatch around his wrist. What is it? Tally. And you can tell this by the Lorentz transformations, which I won't bore you through, but you go, there is a correction factor. It turns out when he gets back, he'll be only 50, it'll only be 15 years and seven months. In other words, he'll return two years and five months younger than his twin brother. And if that doesn't bother you, you weren't listening carefully. Two identical, two identical astronauts. One goes on the trip, one doesn't. The guy that gets back is younger than his twin. Man, that's interesting. Okay. Let, to dramatize this further, let me, ex let, let, let me uh, go a step further. Let's assume we had sent him at 99.99% of the speed of light. Let's assume for the moment that would be possible somehow. That would make the round trip nine years on our calendar, but it would only take 33 days on his calendar. And so let's hope he bought some Microsoft stock on the way or something. But anyway, okay. See, time itself is a physical property. That's the point. We don't think of it that way. But time is a physical property, and it's not uniform. Time, is, it varies with mass, acceleration, gravity, among other things. Well, here's the question then. Is God subject to mass or gravity? By the way, you and I li live in more than three dimensions. There's apparently ten of them. We're going to talk about that in one of the subsequent days on the creation when we get there. So you and I think of time as linear. When we were in school, the teacher put a line on the blackboard from left to right. The left end was the beginning of something, the birth of a famous person, the founding of an empire. The end of that line was the collapse or end of that empire or the death of that person or what have you. It's a timeline. How many of you made timelines in school? Sure, we all have, sure. Incidentally, this time, time has an arrow, by the way. This is a, the, the, time is a very peculiar dimension because it's, it's not two ways. We can move forward and look back. We do that all the time. We look, move forward and look back. 
We can't move back, nor can we look forward, can we? Well, God can, but we can't, okay? Uh, when I'm in California, well, I usually ask, how many of you remember tomorrow? <laughs> when, I, when, when I make this talk in California, I was guarded when I asked that question. <laughs> There is another property of our existence that we're going to get into in subsequent days called entropy, which is a fancy or mathematician's word for randomness in a sense. Um, maximum entropy is a maximum disorder, maximum randomness. When you organize something, you are decreasing its entropy, if you will. It's interesting that the universe is going from order to disorder. That's what we mean by the second law of thermodynamics. The universe is winding down. Thermodynamically, it's winding down um, every other way. Every field of science recognizes the, what they call the law of entropy in, in their observations, except one, only one field of science chooses to ignore it. Um, if you're in physics or any field of science, especially in information, series, uh, information sciences, uh, the only field of science that chooses to ignore entropy, uh, the entropy laws, is biology because they have a problem, because they want to create order out of disorder by itself. And you can't do that. And we'll talk a lot about that as we get to the discussion of life uh, going on. But we'll talk about, we're going to see, we're going to map, ultimately, the six days of creation in an entropy map when we get to, when we get to day seven. But this idea, this linear time is an important concept for us to grasp, because when we think of eternity, we tend, whether we realize it or not, to imagine it like a line that starts from infinity on the left and goes to infinity on the right. We imagine eternity as simply having lots of time. When we sing Amazing Grace, what is it, the fourth stanza? When we've been there 10,000 years, we've no less years, and so it, it embodies this concept that eternity is equivalent to having lots of time. That makes nice poetry, but it happens to be bad physics. And uh, the question then is, is he, the, the, uh, uh, going from infinity to infinity, that's just lots of time. The nature of God, is God subject to the restrictions of mass? I don't think so. Or acceleration, heavens no. Gravity, no. See, God is not someone simply with lots of time. He's outside the restrictions of time. And uh, that's the uniqueness of his personal imprint. You see, that's what, exactly what Isaiah means in Isaiah 57, 15, where he says, Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. See, he's outside time. Since God has the technology to create us in the first place, does he have the means to get a message to us? Of course. The trick is, how does he authenticate his message? How does he let us know that the message is really from him and not some kind of contrivance or a fraud of some kind. And uh, so imagine yourself as an undercover agent in a foreign country, and your host country has suspected that the, uh, you're somehow suspicious of your presence there and has been able to flood you with counterfeit messages from your apparent headquarters. You're suddenly getting all these messages. How do you tell? which ones are really from your control and which ones aren't. Well, one of the ways is you would be looking for some attribute that was unique to your source, that wasn't counterfeitable, if you will, by your host country. You follow what I'm saying? That's, that's sort of an analogy. Maybe it's a clumsy one. But uh, one of the ways that God authenticates his message is to rely on an attribute that is unique to him, not even the angels have. He declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. In the most uh, uh, simplest case, we call that prophecy. God writes history before it happens. All kinds. Perhaps the most uh, incredible one is the history of Israel. It's beginning, it's ups, it's downs, and it's destiny. All laid out in advance and so on. The authentication of Jesus Christ as the Messiah of Israel is awesome to the extent that it is fully documented in the Old Testament centuries before he made his appearance. 
Every detail of his life. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ was not a tragedy. It was an achievement. Skillfully fulfilling hundreds of specific specifications in order to accomplish what God was attempting to accomplish on our behalf. So the geometry of Trinity, we've been looking at as a line from left to right in, in, in a two-dimensional space like a blackboard. Imagine, if you will, that line in three-dimensional space coming out at you from the blackboard, so this curve, if you will. And behind us is the past. Say we're right here in the present. Ahead of us is the future. See, for you and I, life is a sequence of events in time. It's sort of analogous to sitting on the curb watching a parade come around the corner. For you sitting on the curb, it, the parade is a, a series of floats, marching bands, musical groups, whatever, but it's a sequence. But you see, God is not in time. He's outside time, and he can see the past, the present, the future simultaneously. The analogy, perhaps a little crude analogy, is imagine yourself in a helicopter above the parade. You're not in the plane of the parade's existence. You're above it. And you can look and see the staging area where the floats are being assembled to make their appearance. You can watch the things that are passing in review at the moment. You can also look at the destaging area where they're, they're disbanding. You can see the beginning and the end simultaneously. So, because you're, why? Because you're outside the dimensionality of that parade. It's, it's, a, it's an example. It's a clumsy example. Now, I might mention, as long as we have this diagram on the board, we have the press, past, the present, and the future, which are sequential here in time, but at the throne of God, there's a sense in which they're simultaneous, huh? You can turn those arrows the other way if you want. Somebody that died a thousand years ago. Someone that gets raptured a week from Tuesday. And someone that gets, you know, raptured, um, or I, I used a bad example, let me re rephrase it. Someone that died a thousand years ago, someone that died, say, a month ago, and someone that gets raptured a week from Tuesday all can arrive at the throne at the same instant. I'm not saying they do. Don't misunderstand me. I'm suggesting that as a way of stretching your thought horizon here. Eternity is outside time. I love, this is my favorite quote of Dr. Albert Einstein. People like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between the past, the present, and the future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Einstein himself said this. In the beginning, God created the earth. We're going to get to it. We're, going to, we're all now ready to go to the first verse of the book of Genesis. We've taken, we'll take about an hour and a half to do uh, about seven words. There, that's about uh, 28 letters, it turn out. There's 306,000 letters in the Torah, so you can extrapolate to figure out when we were through with the study. No, I'm kidding. In the Hebrew, remember Hebrew goes from right to left. It, it's Bereshit bara Elohim. Bereshit, in the beginning, God, Elohim, bara, created. Bereshit is in beginning, before there was anything. In fact, the uh, Hebrew sages understand from the details of the text that prior to that bet of Bereshit, there was nothing physical. Not empty space, nothing, no, no matter, no energy, no time, nor space. We tend to visualize the Big Bang, we'll get to that a little later, but um, as an explosion in space. No, it created, it, it, the singularity that became the universe was matter, energy, space, and time simultaneously. And the word is bara, a very strange word in the Hebrew. To create out of nothing is what the term actually means. There are two other words that are also used. Asa, which means to make, fashion, or fabricate, implicitly from something already there, like molding clay to make a pot. Or yatza, which is a, is a form. And Isaiah 43, 7 has all three of these words being used. But the word that's being used here is bara, to create out of nothing. And uh, there's another word in here that deserves some comment. And that's the third word, Elohim. You may not know Hebrew, but I suspect you know enough Hebrew to understand that some of the nouns to be a plural, have an I-M ending. What's the singular of a cherub? A cherub. What's the plural of cherub? Cherubim. You can go to Israel and visit a kibbutz. What if you go to several? They're called kibbutzim. Certain classes of Hebrew nouns make a plural by adding what we would call an I-M ending. Elohim 
is a plural noun, Elohim. And yet every place it appears in the, uh, in the text is a grammatical mistake. Most of you, in English, you don't see it as, you're not as sensitive to it as you are in most foreign languages. You have to decline, the, the noun has to agree with the verb, plural, singular, all that sort of thing. Hebrew too. Elohim's a plural noun, but it's used with verbs as if it was singular. In the very vocabulary of the Hebrew, you have a hint of the, what do we call it from the New Testament? Trinity. Trinity. You find it creep in the English translations. We'll see it where God says, let us make man in our image. It creeps into the English translation a couple of places. And uh, so we'll be sensitive to that. But it's a very, that word Elohim, uh, it, it's, a, it's an allusion, if you will, uh, to the Trinity. Um, that leads us, of course, to the age of the earth. Many people have in their Bibles in the center column what they call Usher's Dates. Archbishop James Usher and Dr. John Lightfoot, both in the 17th century, went through a careful study of the genealogies and concluded that the creation occurred in October of 1404 B.C. Some, uh, now, many scholars smile at their naivete to think that the world is only 6,000 years old. They put that in the Bible as a guide because it gives you ability to relatively date certain events together. Um, but I'll tell you what's interesting is more recent scholars, William Henry Green and Warfield, both in the 19th century, Fall Stitch in 79, and Walter T. Brown, very respected researcher in 1995, have gone through and rechecked those, and they have some minor discrepancies, but not much, with Usher's dates. And you will find Bible scholars that to this day don't depart far from the Usher's dates that are so quaintly included in your Bibles. In fact, in six days, these scientists, 50 of them, have gone on record believing that the six-day perception of Genesis 1 is the valid perception, scientifically. And they have scientific reasons for believing that. So the age of the earth is an enigma here. We're going to talk more about that rather provocatively in the next session. But uh, one of the things you and I are going to need to do as we go into this is to shed the baggage of our misconceptions. All of us bring preconceptions to a topic. But 20th century science has vindicated the biblical perspectives of reality that the Bible portrays. And we're going to try to show you that as we go through the six days. We know today that the universe is finite, not infinite. That's a shocking discovery to science, and yet widely understood that way today. We've discovered the nature of time, thanks to Dr. Einstein and all the implications deriving from that. We're going to talk about hyperspaces in a broader sense as we go. But there is only one way you can be certain to avoid truth. Edmund Spencer summarized, there is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all argument, which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before investigation. So what I want you to do as you, as you, when you, bring, when, as you come to these uh, um, studies, Try to set aside the presuppositions we've all been conditioned with from our schooling and from the culture at large because we're going to discover who the ruler of this world really is as we begin to examine the kind of stuff that you and I have been programmed in, even though we may come from a technology background. The scripture has an equivalent uh, uh, expression here in Proverbs 18, 13. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame to him. So keep your mind open as we go. We know that heat flows from hot bodies to cold bodies. You notice that, I assume, right? Well, if the universe was infinitely old, the temperature throughout the universe would be uniform. See, it's cooling. If it's always been around, it's always been cooling until all the temperatures are equal. When the ambient, equal, there is no temperature. All engines depend on the temperature difference. It isn't uniform. Therefore, it's not infinitely old. It had a beginning. And that's the uncomfortable discovery that science has had to deal with, and they call it with the Big Bang. The Big Bang is a very simple idea. First there was nothing, and then it exploded. <laughs> and if you believe that, i got some property I'd like to show you. <laughs> the universe had a beginning, and that implies it will, it's destined for an ending. You and I are in a parenthesis that has a terminus, a beginning, and an end. And... Uh, 
It started with what the scientists like to call a big bang, a singularity, and ultimately goes to a heat death. It'll wind down eventually. And uh, the second law of thermodynamics is an expression of that wind down. When you, say, when you talk about a big bang, that's not a specific theory. That's a collection of different views that all have problems in the literature, in the cosmological literature. We had constant arguments. Uh, the original the steady state model, that was Einstein's, he admitted before he had his biggest mistake, his cosmological constant and all of that. There's a hesitation model that was refuted in the 1960s. I'm going to spare you the details of this stuff. The oscillation model that was refuted by the entropy laws, finally, the lack of mass. There's an inflation model that is currently in vogue. It's kind of interesting because it requires anti-gravity forces that have never been observed for a very short instant and never repeated. So that, you call that science? Now, that's interesting conjectures. Don't misunderstand me. It's a, it's cosmo cosmology, in my opinion, is a field of interest, not a field of science. It's not subject to empirical verification. It's an interesting place to read if you're interested in that sort of thing, but don't confuse the conjectures from a real perception of reality. There is a stretch factor, by the way, that I do want to talk to you about. Um, if you go through the expansion models of the universe, you're talking about an expansion of roughly 10 to the 12th, and uh, the temperature of the quark uh, confinement frees out all energy at 10 to the 9th times 10 to the 12th Kelvin, and I won't get into that. The basic point is the expansion factor. I want to get at this. Dr. Gerald Schroeder, dear friend, lives in uh, Jerusalem. He's a world-class nuclear physicist. He's not a Christian. He's a Jew. He's an observant Jew, but had the privilege of being in his home celebrating uh, Passover some years ago, and he, good friends. He wrote a book called Genesis and the Big Bang. You won't find it in a Christian bookstore. you find it in a, in a books in a regular store, it's, it, it's, but it's a very interesting book. Um, his stretch factor, he takes the stretch factor, 10 to the 12th, and he makes an interesting observation. The 16 billion years times 365 means there are six times 10 to the 12th days, right? So if you divide 6 to the 12th days by the expansion factor 6 to 12, you get a, an expansion factor of about 16 billion years uh, from the day one through the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth day. Uh, so from, as a physicist, he has no problem with the idea of the 16 billion years because his point of view is that a clock at the on the Earth and a clock at the perimeter, if, you, if I can put it that way, of the expansion are going to differ by 10 to the 12th. And if you take the, age, the apparent age of the universe and divide that expansion factor, you get, guess what? Six days, which is what the Bible said all along. So that's his, perce his perception of the thing, which I think is kind of interesting. But you and I need to understand there's two boundaries of reality that we're faced with. We, there are two mathematical conceptions that we have that go beyond physical reality. One of them is infinity. We cannot find infinity in the real universe. The universe is not infinite. And that's either in the macro level or in the microcosm. The universe is not infinite. It's finite. So that's one. In the telescope sense, it's, it's finite. In a microscopic sense, you all think that if you take a line and you cut it in half, you can take what's left and cut it in half again. And you take what's left and cut it in half. You can do that forever. No, you can only do that to about 10 to the minus 35 centimeters. At that point, if you try to cut it in half, it loses locality. All pro uh, we've discovered all photons know what all other photons in the universe are doing instantaneously. That shatters our notions of, of, of reality. It's in we're going to talk about quantum physics in one of our subsequent things. But the idea of infinity at the large or at the microscopic doesn't exist. There's a finite universe, the cosmos is not. There's a finite universe in the sense of co uh, quantum physics. Length, mass, and time are all quantized. They're made up of digits. We are in a simulation. And uh, the other concept we cannot find in the universe is randomness. We simulate it, but the whole discovery of this is a field of mathematics called chaos theory. And that's exactly what the Bible says. The lot is in the lap of the Lord. We'll go into some of this. There are physical chronometers, and uh, let's take a look, quick look at some of these. Radiometric dating, you hear a lot about this, but most of the experts will point out that it's based on three assumptions, all of which are false on extended. It, it, it's dependent on a known clock rate. The clock had to be set accurately at the beginning. The clock must not be disturbed during the measure. And those conditions are usually violated on these extended studies of long time. So most labs will not authenticate something more than a few, a few thousand years. There's also another, the uniformitarian thesis versus catastrophism. The idea of the universe always was the, the way it is now is the basic view of science, Orbital, orbits being always what they were. Yet we have evidence that they weren't, and we'll talk about that as we go through. And uh, let's talk about, I want to get just some of these young earth things in your mind. There's a number of scientists that hold to a young earth because of moon dust, oil gushers, earth's magnetic field, Mississippi River Delta, the salinity of the oceans. 
the pointing uh, Robertson effect, and radio halos. Let's talk about moon dust. The lunar surface is exposed to direct sunlight, strong ultraviolet light, and x-rays can destroy the surface of the exposed rock and, and reduce them to dust. And they estimate this about 10 thousandths of an inch per year. Not a lot, but even that minute amount during the age of the moon could be sufficient to form a layer several miles deep. And when Neil Armstrong was ready to step off you know, Apollo 12, whatever it was, uh, he was concerned about that. All this has been reviewed in the scientific journals because one of the dis wonderful discoveries is that it was, they only had a few thousand years worth of dust. The good news is that it was just a, few, a thin, relatively thin layer of dust that also implies a young moon. Because if it was millions and millions and millions of years old, there'd be more dust, is the point. The Earth's magnetic field. Oh, by the way, I missed one. That's the oil gushers. The, the very pressure of the oil is also an evidence of a young Earth. But the Earth's magnetic field. The magnetic field has a half-life calculated to be about 1,400 years. And based on measurements from 1835 to 1965, you can estimate the age of the Earth it being something less than 10,000 years. And by the way, if you extrapolate that to 20,000 years, the joule heat would, uh, would, would uh, melt the Earth. So there's the, the, the nature of the magnetic field of the Earth itself is evidence of a young Earth, interestingly enough. The Mississippi Delta. Approximately 300 million cubic yards of sediment are deposited in the Gulf of Mexico by the Mississippi River each year. And we study the size of the delta, how much it weighs, and all that sort of stuff. You can estimate that the, it seems that the, Mil the Mississippi River is about 4,000 years old, that, that whole geology. The salinity of the oceans. Uranium, sodium, nickel, magnesium, silicon, potassium, copper, gold, molybdenum, and bicarbonate are just examples of concentrations that are in the ocean, but they're very much less than you'd expect if these elements and compounds were being added to the oceans at the present rate for thousands of millions of years. And by the way, you see, nitrates and uranium do not break down or recycle like salt does. And so the, the, it's, the, it's the lack of more of those that testify to a relatively young ocean. And uh, so the oceans are estimated to be a few thousand years old by the people who specialize in these studies. Then there's this interesting pointing uh, Robertson effect, which some people call the solar janitor. Photons in space slow down the forward movement of objects in space. It's a, it's a thing like solar wind, if you will. The solar drag force it, it, that gets exerted on micrometeorites cause those particles ultimately to spiral into the sun. So this force has an effect of being like a cleanup uh, uh, agency. And uh, the sun is sweeping space at a rate of about 100,000 tons per day, is the estimate by the astronomers. Well, the problem is, also, there's no known source of replenishment. So the current abundance of micrometeorites speaks also for a young universe, interestingly enough. Then there's the, what they call radio halos. Primordial polonium-218 has been found in mica and fluorite in granite. And what makes this rather unusual is polonium-218 has a half-life of about three minutes. So what that implies is that, see, that it appears that it was instantly crystallized when the host granite was formed. So it speaks of an instantaneous creation of both. No other way to explain it. So there's lots of these. I've just picked up a few. We're going to talk also next time about the speed of light slowing down. That was a huge controversy. I was going through my old tapes on Genesis uh, that were more than 10 years ago. And at the time, we talked about Barry Setterfield, the speed of light slowing down, at a time when he was getting beat up by all the physicists because they thought he was a nut. And uh, uh, now we have find out that four out of five related atomic pro properties dependent upon C have been demonstrated to decrease. The speed of light is slowing down. Uh, remember, I spent, I spent a lot of time with Hugh Ross arguing about this one. Um, uh, the, 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 we now know from the Naval Observatory that the atomic clocks relative to the orbital clocks, are, there's a di difference. Either the, the speed of, if, if the speed of light isn't slowing down, the speed of the orbits is increasing. Where are they getting the energy? No, it's the other way around. They're staying the same. The, the, the atomic, if the atomic clocks are correct, see the uh, Mercury, Venus, and Mars are speeding up in their orbits. That's not true. It's the other way around. They're staying. So the, it, there's also the quantization of the red shift. There's a huge discovery by William Tift that shatters the whole concept of the expanding universe. We'll talk about that next time. And the distortion of gravity by the early expansion phase, we'll talk about that next time. Because time stands still even at the event horizon. So all those are things we'll talk about then. But again, our primary discovery is that the Bible we have is designed from cover to cover. Every number, every place name, every detail is there by design. 
and we can prove that that design had to come from outside the dimensionality of time. One integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Jesus said, Think not that I come to destroy the law and the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one yard or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Not one yard or one tittle. Now, yacht is a thing, it's a Hebrew, one of the 22 Hebrew letters that looks, you and I would mistake for an apostrophe. The tittle is a little decorative hook on some of the letters. What Jesus is saying, it's equivalent to us saying, not the crossing of the T or dotting an I will pass until all be fulfilled. And we're going to see that even the structure of the text itself has surprises for us. Next time we'll talk about day one, let light be, and so forth. But remember, the Old Testament is a account of a nation, the New Testament is an account of a man. The Creator became a man, and his central, uh, he's the central event of all history. He died to purchase us and is alive today, and our most exalted privilege is to know him. That's what this study is all about. And we'll go into the verses next time. I have a couple of things I'm going to tag along at the end. You can't come to a Chuck Missler Bible study without being out, having something off the wall. You ready? So this was all straightforward stuff so far. I thought we'd take one thing off. Is the Bible inerrant? You know, I went through high school trying to cling to an inerrant view of the Scripture. I used to get harassed by a friend of mine who was the son of a Unitarian minister who knew his Bible but didn't take it seriously. He used to always say, what about 1 Kings 7.23? That's where you have Solomon's labor. It's 10 cubits in diameter, 5 cubits deep. And the Scripture says its circumference is 3 times the diameter. Well, every schoolboy knows that can't be because the ratio of the circumference of the diameter is pi, not 3. It's 3.14159, et cetera. So, so uh, how do you deal with that? I didn't know how to deal with it then, but a rabbi explained it to me. If you look in the Hebrew, 1 Kings 7.23 in the Hebrew has a kathiv. There's an, when the Masoretes found what they thought was an error, they didn't correct it. They annotated it in the margin with what they thought it should be. The, the, the apparent error or variation would be kathiv. The kiri is the, is the correction in the margin. If you take the word for compass, uh, the uh, circumference here is misspelled, but every Hebrew letter has a numerical value. The Hebrew and Greek have the uniqueness that every letter of the alphabet has a numerical value. And the Hebrew alphanumerics are listed here. I won't go through them all. We just need three of them. Uh, the the kathiv, the written variation, is a kap, a vav, and a he. The what it should be is just a kap and a vav. A kap is worth 100, a vav 6, the he 5. So the word for circumference normally has a value of 106. But here in that particular verse, it has an h at the end, a breath, which is technically incorrect, but it adds five to the value. When you correct that in the value, you discover that the 46-foot circumference is specified to an accuracy of 15 thousandths of an inch. Not bad for the ancient Hebrews. But there's something else I discovered in Great Britain a few weeks ago when it was called to my attention there. It blew me away. I had to throw it in the briefing today just to, for those of you that are technically or mathematically oriented. We looked at Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That was our verse for the day, right? If you look at the Hebrew, it turns out that you take the Hebrew letters, you take the number of letters times the product of the letters, and divide by the number of words times the product of the words, you get pi to four decimal places, 3.1416. I don't know what to do with all the zeros, but okay, that's curious. I wasn't too impressed until he said, well, look at John 1.1. 1, 1. That's the other major creation verse. We looked at Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, this is, by the way, pi, obviously, 10 times 10 70. Let's take a look at... John, by, a little background before we go. I don't know how many, how many of you know what E or an Apian logarithm is. You got a few of you. Good. If you've been in high math or advanced engineering, you've been exposed to John Napier, mathematician. He was an activist for the Reformation, by the way, but that's incidental to our purpose here. He was the inventor of what we call logarithms. A natural logarithm is called an Apian logarithm after him. Log to the base E. It's a strange number. The letter E, the number E, comes up all through advanced math in the strangest places. He also invented the decimal point, by the way, for fractions. But anyway, the E in mathematics is mostly common. It's, it's defined by a limit of a peculiar expression of growth, actually, where n becomes larger without bound. Its limiting value is 2.71828 and so on. The number E forms the base of natural and empyrean logarithms. And you say, what's so what? Well, it shows up if you take that sequence to the end. That's how you get your E value. But let's, let's go. It appears as an exponential growth function. It's the only function that has a rate of growth equal to its size. That's the peculiar mathematical property involved here. And it's the only function having a derivative of itself. 
So, uh, but in, it's, it's, a, it's a necessary component for many curves, like a catenary. That's the shape of a wire between two posts and so forth. Um, it's also, uh, in the study of imaginary numbers, it's a very prominent, it shows up a lot. Without going into them all, it, it shows up in the numbers of probability, and I'll spare you that because we're late tonight, we should keep going here. Uh, it, I can give you scads of uh, equations, the wave mechanics it shows up, electrical theory, advanced math, cosine x, and so forth, um, distribution of prime numbers, as defined by that limit, as I mentioned. The main point is E shows up all over the landscape in mathematics. It's one of the two basic constant universe, pi and E. Well, having said all that, you go to John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Take that in the Greek and do the same thing we did with Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Take the number of letters times the product of letters divided by the number of words times the product of words and guess what you get? You get the value of E of four decimal places and a lot of zeros. I don't know what you, I don't know what you do with that. It's too bizarre to ignore. I'm not sure why all the zeros, what you do with that, but I'm stunned because the probability of that happening by accident is absurd. The, by definition, anything with 10 to the 50th or more uh, is, is, is absurd. So here we have hidden in the very structure of the text of the creation two of the fundamental constants in the field of advanced mathematics, pi and e. And e was not discovered until the 17th century. How did, how did John contrive to put that in his Greek? I don't think he did. I think the Holy Spirit did. Why? I don't know. What the rabbis would call this a rimes, a hint of something deeper. And uh, we'll find more of those as we go through. Next time we'll talk about how the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. We're going to talk, is there a gap between verse 1 and 2? Where does Satan fall? The angels watched the creation of the earth, according to Job and elsewhere. So they were created before the chronicle in Genesis 1, apparently. Was Satan created? Of course he was. When did he fall? We don't know. And there's a whole thing that may or may not be true we'll explore called the gap theory. We'll also talk about this peculiar thing we call light, some of the surprising discoveries about light itself. And that'll be day one. So our next session, we'll talk about day one. What is a day? What do we mean by a day? And it may surprise you what evening and morning really is. Uh, is there a gap between verse 1 and 2? When did Satan fall and where did he come from? What are the mysteries behind the speed of light, uh, uh, the light and so forth? And, and uh, is velocity really a constant as is commonly believed by most scientists? So with that, that's our first toe in the water on this incredible book called the book of Genesis. And uh, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just praise you for who you are. We thank you, Father, for <laughs> your magnificence. We stagger at the realization that you've not only created this universe and given us life in it, but that you care so much for each of us, that you revealed yourself to us, that you've given us your word, and that that word became incarnate and dwelled among us and fulfilled all your requirements on our behalf. We thank you not only for the creation, Father, we thank you for our Redeemer. We do pray, Father, that you would increase in each of us a hunger and a passion for your word, that we each might grow in grace and in the knowledge of that Lord and Savior, that we each might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities before us. As we commit ourselves into your hands without reservation, indeed, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.